Okay, so with a single displacement, I don't even have to do the reaction to know that it might be single. What am I looking for in the reactants? Okay, so I'm looking for an element. In the case of all of our reactions, they're in the format of a piece of metal, right? So that tells me single displacement. Double displacement, what are we looking for in the reactants to see if it's a double? Two compounds. Um, in the combustion ones, you did all the combustion ones today. There's three of them. It's pretty easy because there's fire, right? And then in the bottom of that first page, we have decomp. The answer that I'm looking for there, there's only one reaction. You did it today in week two. There's only one reaction that is only a decomposition. Did anybody figure it out? The hydrogen peroxide one. The key there is to realize that decomps only happen with one reaction. The reactant in this case is hydrogen peroxide. You did put another thing in, but the procedure tells you it's a catalyst. Catalysts are not reactants, they're not consumed. Okay? So quite often when we have a reaction that's catalyzed, it's probably a decomposition, at least at this level. Okay? All right, so after you make your list, then um, the next page, page two, we'll be on now. We're gonna go over one sample reaction and I'm gonna walk you through how to do these. The videos in objective three do a way better job. I'm gonna go kind of quick. This is a process that takes time. You are gonna need your periodic table with the words on the back. So that yellow one, perfect. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm gonna do number 12. Take a look at number 12 in your procedure. And I'm gonna ask that somebody reads the words to me. So iron three chloride and ammonium hydroxide. Oh gee. So whenever whenever we're beginning these, we have it works really well if you write out the name kind of in the format of the chemical reaction. So plus instead of and. And then I'm going to translate. So this is naming from like the last. Last exam we just finished. What's iron? Mm -hmm. What does the three tell us? No, not the subscript. The subscripts are the prefixes, di, tri, tetra. Yeah, it gives us the superscript. So Roman numerals tell us the charge, which is a superscript. Uh, those prefixes give us the subscripts. Don't mix them up. This is very common. Ah, they wouldn't be. So we only use, that's a good question. So you said is the chart, if the charge is negative, we use the same Roman numerals. The Roman numerals only ever apply to metals, and metals aren't capable of being anions for our purposes. When you get farther up, you could make them, but they don't like it. Okay. Um, so no, we don't use negative anions or not shown in form of numerals. Okay. Chloride, what does that mean? Chlorine. And, and so I means it's an ion. So we want to look on the front of our periodic table, find, find a chlorine and find the most common oxidation state, which is the bottom one on the table I gave you guys. What is it? Negative one. So that's what the chlorine charge is. So I think of particles as building blocks, right? So here we have our iron. Here we have a chlorine. 
Are these going to come together to make a balanced compound? No. What do I need more of? Chlorine or iron? Any more negatives? So right now, this would add up to a three plus and one minus adds up to a two plus. I need this to be zero. So we're gonna keep adding chloride until it is. You done? You might guess that no, because I still have. <laughs> that is iron three chloride. The uh, procedure said solution. So when it says solution, what state of matter do we want to use? Aqueous, yeah. So dissolved in water is what solution means. Also, if it has a molarity, so I think this one was 0.1 molar, that molarity tells us it's a solution as well. It means dissolved in water. Okay, so for both of these, it says solution and they have a molarity. And that's a Q. <laughs> okay. So then ammonium. What is ammonium? It's on the back of your periodic table. It's a plus one. I got that from the back of the periodic table. It's the only positively charged polyatomic. And then we wrote hydroxide. What's the hydroxide? Minus, OH minus, right? So is that balance? Yeah, plus one, minus one. We only need one of each to make ammonium hydroxide. So our reaction so far, I'm gonna write like this. All right, so FeCl3, so the subscript is on the chlorine because that's what I have multiple pieces of not on the iron, because I only have one of those. Now, what kind of reaction do we expect this? Double, because we said if there's two compounds, probably a double, okay? So in a double displacement, I used to make students hold these signs and square notes. You guys are lucky, you don't have to do that today. But what I do is I find my cations. I find my cations. You'll notice when I do my carbs, I write them in the same color. They're both the same charge. Find them and I switch them. So this was over here. This was over here. That's all you do. That's what displacement means. All right. Okay. Now we got to do the balancing thing again. Okay, so I notice, I'll put this in the right order. I notice that ammonium has a plus one and chloride has a minus one. So that's done. That's one particle. But I still have these two chlorines just hanging out doing nothing. And what do we notice about this situation? It is. It's not a real compound yet. We have to have the charge that adds up to zero. Right now I have too much positive, so I got to add the negative things. So I just put them on there until I balance it. Right? So three hydroxides will stick to one iron three plus. But if I add two more hydroxide, those had to come from somewhere. They came from being paired up with ammonium. Where do you suppose these are going to go? Where are we going to put them? So at least pointing this way. Right? That was the hard part. I'm waiting to see if you understood. I'm not sure. So our products are just take the cations, swap them, balance the charge again. Okay. So one of our products is iron with three hydroxides. Writing this is confusing to people at first. 
the best thing to do is use parentheses around the group. I want three of the whole group, not three hydrogens. So I put the three outside of the parentheses. Oh, we forgot the H. Okay, and then our other product, what's our other product? Go ahead, yeah, over there. Yeah. So the three in the front means we have three separate particles. Here's one, here's another one, here's another one. We don't use a subscript for that. There's three different particles. We use a subscript for the hydroxide because they're attached to the one particle. Okay. Um, we're missing just one thing. Does anyone see it? Two things. Go ahead. Yeah, because I had to add two more of my hydroxide here and I had to come with the ammonium. So we do have three of those two things. We are also missing one other thing. Okay. Yep. So if you watch the video that I called solubility, you'll see that ammonium is always soluble. So when something is soluble, that means it dissolves in water. We have water present because these were already dissolved in water. So if we conclude something is soluble, it will be aqueous as a product as well. The water does not disappear, it's still there. Does anyone know about this one? Are hydroxides usually soluble or not? They are not, you should watch the video. They are not soluble most of the time. It's only a couple of exceptions. In this case, iron is not one of them. That's a complete balanced reaction. You're gonna struggle a bit with it. The best way to, to do it is to just practice it a lot. It's part of what you're doing in this experiment. Then, then we're gonna do the complete ionic reaction. Okay. So what's really happening when we say aqueous is this. Where my blackboard, green board, oh, we do some fun green screen. Hmm. Anyway, where the green represents water particles surrounding each ion. And you can see the positives kind of hang around the negatives, but they're not actually attached or ion, ionized, they're ions. Okay, and so the same thing um, is true when we have iron attached to the chlorine, but it's not true when you have a solid. This is not ionized. So when we're doing our complete uh, ionic equation, we're looking at the state. If it's AQ, we're gonna break it into pieces. If it is not AQ, so solid, liquid, or gas, we're gonna leave it the way it is, okay? So here's our complete ionic for this reaction. So iron chloride is AQ, so that means we're gonna get an Fe3 plus. I'm not gonna write the state, you want to room. It's implied when you have a charge that is aqueous. How many chloride do we have? Three. So we're gonna write it like this. So what was a subscript when it breaks apart becomes three separate particles. Same deal with this one. I'm gonna apply this three to everything in that compound. So there's three ammonium. And now it's plus because it's not attached to the oxygen when it's aqueous. And three hydroxide. Right. Then we come over here. This just stays as it is because it's a solid. I do write the state for the solid with its gases. And then we have one more aqueous thing. So I'm going to break that apart, applying the three to both of the pieces. You'll notice that when I say breaking it apart, I am not 
breaking apart the polyatomic. I'm not ripping my paper. In other words, I still have NH4 plus, but it's dissociated. It's falling apart from the chloride. Okay, that's what dissolving means when you're ionic, by the way. Uh, oh, I see this in the videos a bunch of times, but I've seen it a couple times already. But um, with our ionic compounds, they're not liquids. That would mean pure. The only way to get an ionic compound as a liquid is to melt it. You need a volcano or a furnace to do that. But we are not doing that. So if it looked liquid, that meant that it's dissolved in water. Thank you. Okay. So that's our complete ionic equation. We're showing everything in the container as it actually exists. The last step is to remove anything that doesn't actually react. We call these spectator ions. It just means that we could put anything with that charge in that spot and it would still do that, okay? So looking at our complete ionic equation, which chemicals happen on both sides so I can cross them off? Iron? No, because the iron is three plus on this side, but over here it's FeOH3, so I can't cross that. Okay. Sure, because that doesn't change. Same thing, both sides. Yeah, yeah sure, same deal there. So, in the end, what I'm left with is everything that we didn't cross off. This is the actual chemical change we observe because a precipitate was made or because a gas was made because we don't break up gases either or because a liquid was made. That's what determines whether a reaction would happen or, would happen or not for those. Okay, so like any questions? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. How come I want three what? So we have like one chlor uh, iron chloride yeah, and three of these? Well, it's there, but we cancel it with the number of hydroxyls, which is the same thing we do on this side. The reason it stays as FeOH3 is because it's a solid. So if it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, it's not going to change between the two types of reactions. So that's what we're looking for, solid, liquid, gas. If we don't see that in the, in the net ionic equation, if everything cancels out because it was all aqueous, then we shouldn't have observed any anything. In our, in our lab notebook last week. Okay, that would be no reaction. The other one I want to call to your attention is one of the ones you've done today is actually two different types of reactions. You should classify it as a double displacement first, but then you should realize that another one happens after that. So the reaction that has baking soda in it with um, hydrochloric acid, that's two compounds, right? So double, I forget which number this is, but it's one of the ones you did today. 15, so whatever, yeah. So double displacement says, let's find the cations and swap them. And in acid, your cation is always hydrogen ion, H plus. That's the H's in front. Here, we should have two, but this is the cation we care about. So where do we find cations in a compound? The front, always the front. You should write them that way as well. Don't give me like CLH. 
confuse me. I'm easily confused. So all we gotta do is just swap them to get our products, right? So, I mean, what are, what are the two products? What are they? Swap the purple box. Sure. So we take the sodium and we're going to swap it so it, now it's paired up with the chlorine. Cool. Now we got to take the hydrogen and pair it up with all the rest of this thing. So sometimes people will write it like this. There's a better way though. Go ahead, Bailey. See it? Yeah. Is salt soluble in water? I hope so. Cooking would be gross without it. This is called carbonic acids. Are acids soluble in water? Acids. That's our definition of what an acid is, actually. We name it as an acid if there's hydrogen in the front and it's aqueous. So initially, if this was all we did, we would assume that you would observe no reaction occurring because it's aqueous, aqueous. But that's not the whole story. Because anytime you make carbonic acid, it's going to undergo another reaction. That's a decomposition. You've got to always be on the lookout for this whenever you're reacting with carbonate. Okay. So decomposition, you want to know what it decomposes into? Two really common things. Hmm. Of course, CO2 is a gas. What are we going to write for the state of matter for water? Liquid. Not aqueous. You don't dissolve water in water, right? Water is the solvent, so it's pure. So overall, if I add these two reactions together, the carbonic goes away. We have one on the reactant side, one on the product side. It's not there in the beginning or the end, in other words. So to do the net ionic equation, I would want to have just the reactants in the beginning and the products in the end. There's like a small mistake people make. So in the beginning, we have our carbonic acid, and we have our HCl. Our salt is still there. That's one of our products. People leave that off sometimes, so be careful. And then our other products are the water and CO2. Right? So the evidence for this reaction, there's actually two pieces, but most people don't see the second one. What do you think the evidence of this reaction would be? That our products, what do we see? Sure, yeah, we see bubbles. We would also detect a little bit of heat from generating H2O. A lot of times people miss that one because they're fascinated by the bubble thing. There's a lot of bubbles that are really obvious, but the heat is also there. Okay, so what you need to do is finish this packet for all the reactions, one through 19, so both parts uh, B and D, okay? Bring it no later than next week. That's your cutoff for getting credit for doing just the worksheet so that I can come around and correct it while you're in lab next week. And you can get 100% when you turn it in in your report. Next week, it's either you did it or you didn't do it. So just try everything. You'll get the five points, okay? No, it's a combination of a double displacement first. And then this part is a decomposition. But in terms of the balanced reaction, this is what we want to start with to do the net ionic. Because you want the real reactants and the final products. 
Okay, don't forget to turn your yellow sheets into me and clean up. If you're, if you're not done, go ahead and finish the experiment, of course. <laughs> 